Hey guys, welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast, episode 3 with Pierre Rochard, and the theme is Bitcoin Investment Theses. So Pierre has been around Bitcoin for a while and he's a very insightful thinker. He's been quite influential over the years in terms of his understanding and foresight in terms of the investment case for Bitcoin. He has a strong Austrian economics background and knowledge, and that's combined with a good technical understanding of Bitcoin. Pierre is a co-founder of the Nakamoto Institute. He is also a co-host of the Noted podcast, and he also runs Bitcoin Advisory, which you can find at bitcoinadvisory.com. He also has various Twitter uh, projects such as Bitcoin Mergers. They're also worth a follow. So many people who have listened to his interviews and read his material have had aha moments, and I'm sure you'll really enjoy listening to this conversation with Pierre. Hey, Pierre, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on, Stephen. Let's jump into it. So uh, from your point of view, what is the point of Bitcoin and what is its potential future value? I think the the point of Bitcoin is to become uh, the global money, the sound money, uh, and the uh, pillar of civilization in the 21st century. Uh, Right now, the US dollar is kind of the global money. Uh, which gives the United States kind of a disproportionate amount of financial power and also I think is at the root of the financial problems that we have saw come to light with the global financial crisis. Um, so the first thing I wrote when I got interested in Bitcoin was end the Fed, hoard Bitcoins. So I think ending fractional reserve banking, central banking, and um, fiat government fiat monies uh, would provide an immeasurable amount of value to human civilization and allow us to uh, move forward. So um, I think that in terms of what its potential future value is, uh, really hard to have very good com- comparables. If we start with fiat, uh, so you know, there's different measures of money supply, M0, M1, M2, M3. Um, but I think that in any case, they suffer from a deep bias in the sense that uh, due to fiat's inflationary nature, uh, governments can't help themselves but print more money and uh, make life easier for themselves to pay for whatever pleases either the voters or uh, the uh, dictators that are running these Ponzi schemes. Um, and so fiat is always inflating. And so there's a bias against ever holding it as part of your portfolio. Uh, so you know, you have like very, um, whether it's at a personal level where you working with a financial planner, they're not going to put you in more than like 5% cash. Right. Um, and even among like hedge funds, there's very, it's very uh, unusual to see a hedge fund have a third of their capital in cash or half of it in cash. Um, so the reason for that is that you want to always be invested so that you're not having inflation eating away at your cash. Um, and that hasn't always been the case. So, for example, if you look back at what was written in the Torah, which is like ancient uh, Hebrew Jewish writings, uh, teachings back millennia ago, uh, they said to keep a third of your wealth in cash, which at the time was gold, uh, a third in your business and a third in land. Uh, so today that would be like a very unusual asset allocation. Um, so I think that Bitcoin is not a good, or it can't be compared to fiat today because in a, uh, in a full adoption scenario of Bitcoin, uh, p- people would be holding a much larger percentage of their portfolio in Bitcoin than they currently are in fiat, which means that Bitcoin would have a much higher value than the value you would get by looking at just uh, money supply. Um, and I would have a similar criticism for gold, actually, which is that uh, gold ultimately uh, is more inflationary than Bitcoin is. Now, right now, if you look at the annual, you know, increase of supply of gold versus increase of supply of bitcoins, and I, I want to set aside any uh, any debate about what the de- definition of inflation is. I'll, I'll just be using the word very loosely in our conversation. Um, 
But uh, if you look at the different rates of, of creation, you know, what uh, safety and calls the uh, stock to flow ratio, um, right now, Bitcoin has a worse stock to flow ratio than gold does. But uh, over the long run, uh, that that is going to improve dramatically. And I think that that's why gold isn't necessarily a, a very good uh, comparable on top of, you know, looking at its other properties uh, in in terms of it not being digital, right? Yeah, no, these are great points. And I think you make a good point there that gold is not the appropriate comparable. And the gold market is, what, 7 or $8 trillion? And if we were to look at global M3 broad money, we're looking at something like $90 trillion. And so, in a sense, that means – you know, it's you're you're spelling out an even more bullish kind of final future value. Not that there's a final value, um, but yeah, just but indicative. At, yeah. at equilibrium over over the long run, and really the other thing is that we we just we've never had a, a money that is this deflationary. And so, what are what is people's marginal propensity to hold bitcoins in two thousand one hundred? is unknowable. Um, but if we kind of triangulate based on, uh, you know, things like gold or, or fiat, uh, we can clearly see that Bitcoin will have an astounding marginal propensity to hold and thus uh, a astronomical value at the margin. Yeah, no, great points. Agree with that. And so this all ties in very well with the theme for today's episode, which is your articles that you wrote, Bitcoin investment theses. So uh, maybe you want to just give a quick overview of Bitcoin investment theses. Yeah, so we kicked off the podcast with really the most bullish uh, possible investment thesis, which is uh, what I think is like the ultimate um, goal of Bitcoin. Uh, But obviously, there's a lot of people who don't see it the way I do and are more skeptical or have um, kind of a more prob- probabilistic approach to it. Like I, I assign a 100% probability to uh, Bitcoin taking over, but um, it, it's fine if people don't share that view. Uh, and there's a wide array of alternative investment theses for Bitcoin, which uh, different people find more or less persuasive. Um, and I kind of map it out onto a... Uh, a, a graph or a chart, and if you look at the x-axis, that's kind of the potential adoption. So, how how many people would be using Bitcoin um, for this particular use case? And then the y-axis is the holding period. So, for if if you kind of think about it, like okay, if there's a hundred people using um, one Bitcoin for one month. Uh, that's the same as one person using one Bitcoin for 100 months. Uh, and so if you take those two variables together, I think that that gives you an idea of if uh, where, where the value is in the sense that something that has a very low number of holders uh, for their use case. So, for example, like um, if you take uh, the nest egg for dictators uh, thesis, there's very few dictators or uh, very few, you know, families affiliated with dictators or beneficiaries of dictatorships. And so that's a very small pool of holders. Um, but they're more, the, and this thesis was put forward by George Soros, uh, who, who said that Bitcoin might not crash as much as we would expect because it is such an ideal form of a nest egg for dictators. Um, and then on the other side, on the holding period, you know, you can think about, Okay, well, how would a dictator actually use Bitcoin? How long would he have to sit on it? Maybe he he sits on it uh, for the duration of his dictatorship. And then when things start falling apart, uh, he, you know, goes off to a foreign country and lives off of his nest egg. So that would be a very long holding period, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years or however long. Um, And that gives you an idea of, of if this thesis is true. How much value does Bitcoin uh, accrue from it? Um, and then kind of on the opposite side of the spectrum, you might have like uh, machine to machine micropayments where these machines never actually really hold Bitcoins for more than a few seconds uh, because they pass it along uh, and thus 
it's not uh, a very long holding period, but there's potentially billions of machines. Uh, there might be more machines than humans eventually. And so uh, that might be a very, very large market of, of holders that just don't hold for very long. Um, so yeah, that's right. kind of the, the way I was uh, theorizing about it. Yeah, okay. No, that's great. And then I think you've kind of answered my next question, which is sort of why do we care about holding period? And as you've pointed out, it's that the longer that holding period, the more it really adds to the what we might call the reservation demand of Bitcoin as opposed to that sort of transitive or just using it purely as a payment rail aspect. And then I think what is the significance of time preference in these different uh, investment theses? Yeah, so I, th- I think, uh, well, I, w- I did want to add that there's kind of a third variable here, which is what's the probability of this thesis being true? Um, yeah. And so, like, I think that the machine to machine micropayments, um, while on paper are interesting, I think that, like, the probability of that actually being a, uh, um, a significant adoption vector for Bitcoin. It's just very low. Um, and there's other things too, like for example, uh, well, even the nest egg for dictators thesis, I don't know how interested uh, most dictators within the foreseeable future are going to be interested in Bitcoin. Uh, they're probably going to be interested in Bitcoin when there is full adoption in the sense that it's, it just becomes a de facto you know, form of global settlement money. But in the meantime, uh, it seems like they're more interested in offshore entities that are, you know, as we saw in the Panama Papers, there's obviously plenty of legal uh, ways for them to get money offshore um, without resorting to Bitcoin. But anyway, uh, to answer your question uh, regarding time preference, so I think that it's interesting. Um, I don't think that oh, as an investor – you should be looking at like what what are people's time preferences and how does that align with Bitcoin? But the problem is that there's reflexivity in it. And so arguably Bitcoin lowers people's time preferences uh, and it causes them to change their behavior and change their uh, their even their you know, personality. Uh, so it's very hard to say a priori, OK, well, this thesis uh, lends itself to high time preference or to low time preference because it can have a transform- transformative effect on people. Um, so, for example, maybe someone uh, was using Bitcoin to buy drugs on the Silk Road. And so that's that's kind of, in my view, the, the baseline definition of high time preference. Right. Uh, yep. But uh, perhaps they held a residual amount of Bitcoins that went up dramatically in value and suddenly their time preference changed and they were like, oh, wow, I can have a uh, by saving and by not doing drugs, I can increasing my wealth and do more drugs in the future. Um, and so uh, <laughs> that, that, would, uh, that were their time preference. Came for the drugs, stayed for the sound money. So, uh yeah. Um, okay. No, that's that's a really nice way to outline it. And one thing that I really like that you've done with the investment thesis is that you've tried to be balanced. You've tried to present the pro argument and then the anti, you know, the anti thesis for that same argument. Um, I suppose out of your theses that you've got, you know, if we're going to take them and we're going to nail them on the front door of the BIS. Which case is the strongest case? Which one do you think is the most likely or kind of most powerful case? Well, some of these are already being realized today. So I think that just de facto, they are the strongest cases. So speculative trading, I think, is uh, the strongest case. Um, these these online casinos like BitMEX or Binance, um, they just have a tremendous amount of volume going on them of people punting on what the uh, value of Bitcoin will be today and tomorrow. And so I think that that just de facto, if we look at reality, that's definitely the case that speculative trading is the uh, greatest uh, or the strongest case uh, for Bitcoin. Um, now, the the problem with that use case is that you can argue that, well, it's like Beanie Babies, like people will latch on to the next you know, speculative investment 
that comes along, and that's not really a sustainable advantage. So I think that if we have that as the strongest case, uh, I would put the second strongest case as um, holders of last resort is, I think, the strong second strongest case. And in my mind, uh, I think that, you know, Trace is the authority on, on this. He's the one who came up with the phrase. Uh, and the phrase comes from the fact that in, in fiat, fractional, you know, central banking, you have the lender of last resort, which is that if there's a bank run and the entire uh, system of fractional reserve lending is insolvent, uh, you have someone, some entity that is capable of uh, bailing the whole system out and uh, reintroducing liquidity to it. So that's kind of in the traditional system. And in, in Bitcoins, you have the the holders of last resort, which is that uh, when, and this is a very important point, which is, the, and uh, Warren Buffett made this point, Bitcoin is a non-productive asset. And that's actually true of any money. Uh, any money is a non-productive asset. Um, and the what provides a floor for the value of a non-productive asset. So for a productive asset, it's the cash flows or, you know, the, the yeah. fundamental value, uh, the liquidation value. Um, but for a non-productive asset, uh, it is the holders of last resort. The, the people who no matter what will not, <clears throat> excuse me, will not sell their Bitcoins. Um, and the reason that holders of last resort exist is that they have a combination of some kind of irrational um, ideological motivation. And so in my case, it's, you know, to end the Federal Reserve, but also just the, this, this uh, crazy wild community we've built. Um, you know, I, I, I don't see myself ever uh, selling Bitcoins and uh, getting out of the game and, you know, deleting my Twitter account. Uh, I don't know what I would do with the rest of my life. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. The I think the more rational aspect of it is that they're essentially uh, discounting the future value of this becoming a global money. And so it's an entrepreneurial undertaking, uh, taking on this, this price risk today, because we're anticipating that in the future, other people will also view this nonproductive asset as money. Um, and I think that that's, that's really the the most confusing part about Bitcoin uh, because you'll have people come out and say, oh, you know, Bitcoin's too volatile to be a medium of exchange or too volatile to be a store of value. Uh, and thus it's, it doesn't fit the definition of money and thus it's a scam or it's a Ponzi or it's tulips. Um, I think that what's missing from that analysis is that, okay, may, maybe that's true today, but can we envision a future where that's not, that's no longer true and that it has reached um, some sort of equilibrium state of adoption. And, you know, we can debate about where, where what that adoption percentage would be, whether it's a hundred percent adoption or a niche five percent adoption, but nevertheless, at once it's reached its full adoption, wouldn't we expect that its value would be relatively stable? Um, and so to me, holders of last resort are really thinking about, all right, we have not reached equilibrium adoption yet. And there's no way that I'm going to trade these Bitcoins, these um, UTXOs on the UTXO set for uh, whatever is promised to me, whether it's uh, you know the next Bitcoin or um, a, a, a Twitter scam. Yeah, no, these are fantastic points. I think, and, and you make a good point around, it's almost like a category error. People look at Bitcoin and they think that it should just be like a stock or a bond and it should have some kind of, you know, some kind of either dividend or capital gain and that's all that it could be. But I think that, you know, and the point that you've made there is that really they need to look at this like it's a potential new global money, which is a a special kind of good. It's not the same thing that will you know, throw off a dividend it's in the same way that gold doesn't throw off a dividend for you every year, right? Um, and I, I guess while we're on the topic of gold, some people have characterized Bitcoin as a kind of digital gold. And I know you've made comments on this in the past on Twitter. Uh, and I think you may basically you were making the, the point that it's directionally correct, but it's just an inadequate uh, 
analogy to explain just how much better Bitcoin is. So could you elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, and it, it's, it's really to, to no fault of anyone because historically, every time there's a new technology, um, the baseline is kind of what the previous one was. So, you know, you had horseless carriages uh, was the, the word for cars before, uh, which today sounds kind of absurd. So eventually I think that uh, we'll, we'll talk about gold as being physical Bitcoins uh, rather than Bitcoin being digital gold. Um, but the, the, the reason that... Um, the reason I really don't like the metaphor very much is that it it undersells Bitcoin by a lot. Uh, and I think that uh, it really, it, it's great for marketing to gold bugs and people who are already uh, kind of interested in sound money. But in terms of capturing the full economics and also the um, inevitability of it, uh, I think it's inadequate. And the the inev- inevitability of it, I think, s- stems from the fact that with gold, gold had a good chance of doing a speculative attack against the dollar uh, during the late 1970s uh, when it had that massive run up. Uh, the dollar, you know, the consumer price inflation in the U.S. was at 20 percent. And then Paul Volcker stepped in and essentially reestablished the U.S. dollar as a uh, let's call it a quasi sound money uh, by letting interest rates. Uh, float to 20% and then having uh, the money supply being targeted. And that reestablished the credibility of the dollar's uh, monetary policy and essentially quashed any hopes we had of of gold doing a speculative attack on the dollar. Um, and I think that, you know, part of the credit goes to Volcker and the strength of the U.S. dollar, but part of the credit or the discredit goes to gold's uh, relatively high inflation in the sense that the higher the price of gold goes, the more gold gets mined, right? The, the, the more economical it becomes to uh, mine more gold and thus you can produce more gold. Whereas with Bitcoin, with the difficulty adjustment every two weeks, you don't really have that effect. Um, and so the, when the price of Bitcoin is skyrocketing, it's not like the miners can produce, you know, twice as many bitcoins to fulfill this demand and kind of stabilize the market, uh, yeah. and that's why I think that Bitcoin actually has a much higher chance, and frankly, an inevitable uh, outcome of uh, of destroying these fiat currencies. And um, so the digital gold meme, and same thing with kind of like the store of value, uh, you know, y- using that phrase, uh, is good marketing. Uh, I, I don't think that it captures the whole picture. Um, and maybe, you know, it's it's good to not capture the whole picture sometimes, uh, leave a little mystery. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great point. I think, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's out there for people to really take it and take it further than what we've gone before. Um, okay. Uh, now, a lot of people complain about illegal use cases of Bitcoin. So, for example, judgment resistance, the nest egg for dictators, as you mentioned before, money laundering, the use of Bitcoin in you know crypto scamming like crypto lockers and so on, or those Twitter scam bots use in you know uh, you know drug markets and prostitution and porn and so on. Uh, do you have any comments on whether this will change the adoption of Bitcoin as money, or is it just really kind of neutral? And the fact that it can be used for anything is you know, that's just a, that's just money. Yeah. I, I, the latter, I think these are just like epiphenomena of, of a, a money. Um, and from an investor's perspective, uh, there's kind of two ways to see it. One is that if Bitcoin is really good for all these nefarious activities, then that means that there's going to be, it's going to have value. And in fact, you could argue that Bitcoin bootstrapped itself off of the Silk Road. And that was like one of the major catalysts of creating demand for uh, Bitcoin. Um, Now, uh, the other view, which also, you know, is credible, um, is that due to Bitcoin's permissionless system where anyone can be sending transactions pseudonymously, you know, with an internet connection, 
Uh, it has attracted these illegal activities, and thus governments are going to intervene and really crack down on it hard. So practically speaking, uh, I, I kind of approach it from a U.S. perspective because that's where I live. Uh, the government has been uh, very insistent on exchanges having KYC, AML, Know Your Customer, anti-money laundering uh, controls so that uh, these illegal activities are choked off. And the problem is that that creates friction for people who want to buy Bitcoins, you know, without revealing their identity, uh, which they might want to do, not because they're going to do anything illegal, but because they want to preserve their privacy and not, uh, you know, have someone burglarize their home because this person hacked the Coinbase customer database and, you know, found their home address and is now pointing a, a gun at their dog, you know, saying, uh, hand over your Bitcoins. So there's there's lots of legitimate reasons for not wanting uh, your, your, your identity to be attached to your Bitcoins. Um, but because Bitcoin has been used for nefarious activities, uh, governments have put in place regulations. And then at the extreme, governments have, have quote unquote, banned Bitcoin in their jurisdiction uh, out of a concern to, you know, mitigate illegal activities. Yeah, good points. Uh, interesting that you point out, you know, you've got to consider it from the U.S. point of view. Um, but even still, as an investor, you have to consider at the global level because, you know, we're, we've got jurisdictional competition, right? And what will happen is that some countries that are very permissive of Bitcoin will kind of attract a lot of capital. Uh, do you have any comments on that sort of global case for Bitcoin and the jurisdictional competition? Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, I, I, I overhear things like uh, I've overheard that Malta is a, a friendly jurisdiction. Um, and then I, I saw a picture of one of the big exchange CEOs was visiting Bermuda and they seem to be friendly with them. So clearly there's jurisdictions that are going to be friendlier than others. But I don't think that there would be any jurisdiction that would say, okay, no KYC AML, uh, you know, so, uh, anything goes here uh, f for fiat on and off ramps. Because ultimately, uh, if, if that were to happen, the it will, first of all, it would get abused, right? Because you kind of have a uh, adverse selection bias where, uh, okay, now all of the fraudsters are using your jurisdiction. Um, and then that abuse would lead to whether it's SWIFT or the Federal Reserve or any of these uh, big fiat, uh, you know, payment system uh, uh, you know, organizations would, would shut off that jurisdiction. And we've seen them do that for other reasons to countries like Iran, uh, where they essentially cut them off from the world financial system uh, as a form of punishment or sanctions. And so there's there's only so much a jurisdiction can do. Now, I think that what's what's very promising is models where you you don't have a fiat on an off ramp uh, and you essentially use. Uh, you know, quote unquote, stable coins, or even just uh, sending Bitcoin. So for example, BitMEX, like you cannot deposit fiat at BitMEX, you send your Bitcoins there. And then they, they, uh, you, you trade with uh, your Bitcoins there. So that's a way of getting around these uh, onerous uh, financial legacy financial institution regulations. Um, but you know, people will debate whether that's good or bad. Yeah, sure, sure. Agreed. Uh, let's go now into the sort of next steps on the path to the investment mainstreaming of Bitcoin. What we're now starting to see is large financial institution chief executives come out and comment on Bitcoin. We're seeing billionaires come out and comment on Bitcoin. Uh, let's start with one in particular, which I know you've commented on in the past, Lloyd Blankfein, who is the outgoing uh, chief executive of Goldman Sachs. Uh, do you want to comment a little bit on on what he said about Bitcoin? Yeah, so he really, he, he touched on, I think is the most important thing to understand about money, which is that on 
some level, money is a, a, a social phenomena. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go so far as to say that it's a social construct or, uh, a, uh, you know, some, something that's like artificially created by humans out of thin air. Um, because it's definitely grounded in, uh, well, for gold specifically, you know, in its chemistry and in its uh, properties uh, and its scarcity. Um, and then I think that fiat essentially is just piggybacking off of uh, and going off of the momentum of gold going into the 20th century. Uh, and Bitcoin has its own properties that we can get into. But at the end of the day, all these things are properties that are recognized by humans, by individuals. And the more individuals uh, agree on these properties uh, being uh, indicators of a good money, uh, the more participants you have in the monetary system and in, in the um, you know, indirect exchange economy, Cadillacy, as the Austrians would say. So uh, what Lloyd recognized was that, well, I, you know, I don't know, do I call him Mr. Blank? Fine. I don't know him on a first name basis, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the outgoing CEO of Goldman Sachs, he was saying that, um, you know, people were very resistant when money went from being gold to fiat. And, you know, the Austrians would argue, rightly so. Uh, and you could see the same thing of people being resistant going from fiat to cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin specifically. Um, and that essentially, if if he were to have to explain how it happens, and, you know, he, he kind of uh, was very... Um, he, he put up some disclosures, which is that he, he himself does not own any, Goldman doesn't own any, and he's not super excited about it. But if if looking back on it and, you know, if we're in a world where Bitcoin has taken over and he were asked to explain how, uh, it would be that people changed their the social consensus of what money is. Um, and so essentially, to the extent that once baseline properties have been established uh, to be a money, and I think that Bitcoin has established those, um, then it really is just a matter of human psychology and of uh, people agreeing uh, to to Bitcoin being their money. And, you know, Bitcoiners are, in, in my view, uh, if you were to draw like concentric circles, like a, a target for, you know, shooting arrows, like Bitcoin the holders of last resort are, are the kernel of that. And then you have concentric circles around that of, of people jumping in and uh, being convinced that Bitcoin's the future of money. And at, at the outer periphery of that, you have the, the no coiners. Uh, well, and now let's, let's be specific. When I say no coiners in this context, I do actually mean people who, who actually don't own any Bitcoins. Um, but uh, they're they're slowly gravitating, and you know, as Jay was pointing out in in your earlier podcast, that uh, their their mind has been captured, and so eventually they buy a little bit, you know, just for fun, just to see what the, all the hubbub is about. Uh, and then the price goes up ten x, a hundred x, and now they've got a serious investment, uh, and they're adding to it. Um, so anyway, to go back to uh, the question about Lloyd, uh, wow, I, I was rambling there. Um, no, no, I, I think, think that's that, um, actually quite good. Go on. Yeah, we, we see this uh, process of social consensus uh, of accretion uh, happening, and the social consensus is getting louder and louder. And so right now, you know, I think Bill Miller is the biggest uh, Wall Street Bitcoin bull, uh, and he represents the, the vanguard of this trend. And I think that it's just the uh, tip of the spear at this point, but... We're going to see it more and more common where uh, on one hand you have people, I think the CEO of BlackRock was saying that none of his portfolio managers uh, thought anything of Bitcoin. And that's fine. Uh, they'll be the late adopters. But uh, the the gains will go to the early adopters. Uh, and we'll start seeing more and more portfolio managers saying that there's a role for Bitcoin uh, in a portfolio, You know whether it's one percent or five percent or whatever it may be um but just part of it will be based on looking at the quantitative aspect of bitcoin and this and the, i i find it kind of silly but there's actually a lot of truth to it which is that if you just look at the historical returns of bitcoin 
and their lack of correlation with other assets, um, and also just the very high sharp ratio, which is you know how much are you getting paid to to take on the volatility of uh, owning bitcoins. Um, it's very attractive in that regard. And then on the qualitative level of looking at all of these investment theses and seeing, oh well, you know, even if we don't think that Bitcoin is going to supplant all fiat currencies, uh, it's still, you know, judgment resistance is an interesting investment thesis, or um, you know, doing a high value settlement of payments uh, across borders, you know, whatever whatever rationalization they might have uh, to get them to invest a portion of their portfolio. Yeah, no, fantastic points. I think, yeah, you make great points there around the uncorrelated nature of Bitcoin versus other traditional assets. And also the sharp ratio comment that basically it's paying a very high return for the level of risk that you're taking on. And so some people view it almost like it's a positive expectation lottery ticket sort of bet. Um, Okay, so I think the next thing would be if you're a young person and you're interested in Bitcoin, what should you think about from a Bitcoin investment strategy point of view? Yeah. um, So I think that the first thing you've got to work on is uh, yourself. Uh, So I think that educating yourself, uh, whether it's about Bitcoin or about uh, finance or monetary economics, you know, if, if you find that it, it, if you find it interesting, definitely dig into it. Uh, if you, if you don't find it interesting, um, then I think that you're going to have a really hard time understanding Bitcoin because it's in such uh, an early stage. And so I don't think that humans are actually uh, meant to cope with or reason about uh, the emergence of a new money, and uh, it's just it's so foreign to us because it's just never happened. You know, at some point, gold had a value of zero. That is that people thought of gold as being worthless. Uh, now, this might have been like Neanderthal days or before that. I, I, uh, I'm not an anthropologist. Uh, you know, maybe even anthropologists probably don't even know themselves. You'd have to like teleport or uh, time travel back to the, to the the first Cro-Magnon who picked up a gold nugget and saw it shine a little bit and was like. I'm going to hold this <laughs> and uh, <laughs> someone's going to have to uh, barter with me uh, for me to give this up. Um, but anyway, so gold built up its value over centuries and millennia. And then fiat kind of piggybacked off of gold. We've, we've, I, I haven't read of any uh, historical accounts of a fiat money starting with a value of zero and, you know, accruing value from there. Uh, I think that's unheard of. Um, and, uh, Bitcoin comes in and it does have a value of zero and now it has a value, an ever changing value, but you know, it's, it's in the billions of dollars of, uh, total money supply. And I, it has done a number on people in the sense that it's, uh, I think it's caused a huge amount of misunderstanding about, first of all, why it has this value in the first place. Um, and then people wanting to replicate that phenomenon with, uh, you know, their their altcoin du jour. Uh, and so if you're young and coming into this, I think that you can learn a lot of uh, misinformation uh, and, uh, you know, learn, essentially learn the wrong lessons from Bitcoin uh, and get involved in things that either won't have lasting value or are just straight up scams, uh, and you know, are ultimately unfulfilling from the perspective of of changing the direction of uh, mankind. So, uh, my advice would be to, if you're not interested in monetary economics, and you're going to only read one book about money, uh, it would probably be the Ethics of Money Production by Gita Holzman. And if you're not into reading, he has an excellent YouTube uh, video that's an hour long. And if an hour is too long, you can put it on 2x and listen to it in 30 minutes. And you'll uh, probably have to watch it twice because it's a lot of information to absorb. But uh, you'll have a fairly decent understanding of uh, what the monetary underpinnings of Bitcoin are, even though he doesn't say the Bitcoin word once. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but uh, that aside, I think the the next step for a young person would be to really think about whether they're interested in programming or not. Um, and so there I would go on codecademy.com and do a few tutorials and see, are you interested in programming? Uh, it's okay if you're not, there's a lot of other things to be done, but if you are, then you should by all means get a hundred percent involved in uh, software development and Bitcoin software development. And so uh, pick up a copy of Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos. Um, and, you know, if, if you have the means or if you can get a scholarship to do a Jimmy Song's programming blockchain course, uh, that'll get your feet wet in the technical underpinnings of Bitcoin uh, and enable you to, whether you do it as a career or as a hobby, uh, get involved in, in Bitcoin programming. Um, now, from an investment perspective of straight up financially, I think that it's a very uh, difficult uh, area to be in because basically we have a lot of young people graduating from college with a lot of student loan debt and traditional financial planning advice would be to pay off that student loan debt before you start making highly speculative investments. Um, and you know, there's a lot of truth to that. And so if, if you want to, and the reason there's truth to it is because these, these student loans have like 8% interest rates on it, which means that if you pay off that student loan debt, that means that you're earning a risk-free 8%, which is pretty good in terms of traditional investments. Now, if you look at historical returns of Bitcoin, uh, you know, Bitcoin increases by hundreds of percents a year on average. Uh, but uh, how much can you rely on that? And how much risk do you want to take on? If you're young, I would argue that you can take on a lot of risk. Now, if you're a little older and you have family and kids and uh, maybe have a little less risk. Uh, and so uh, there, I would argue that if you've got student loan debts, you know, pay off your student loan debts at a reasonable rate, as a reasonable pace, uh, and start accumulating some Bitcoins. Um, but really focus on changing your lifestyle so that you're spending less and learning more. Uh, I think that if you're in your 20s, the most important thing you should be doing is learning. Uh, and that'll enable you to have either a high paying job or uh, have a start your own company, start your own venture. Um, but really, the, the, the two things are reduce your expenses and increase your income. Uh, and so it, those are our, the most important uh, pieces rather than on the investment side. I think that the investment side is really downstream of that. And so you've got to have savings to invest in the first place. Uh, and then you have a, a first class problem of figuring out where to put your money. Yeah. Yeah. Great points. Agreed with that. Uh, one other question that I thought would be good to get your thoughts on, and I get this view when I attend Bitcoin meetups, and sometimes there are altcoiners there and basically some of these altcoiners they they think of it like oh why would i buy bitcoin when you know bitcoin might you know quote unquote only do 2x or 5x or 10x from here whereas you know in a year if i buy this altcoin there's a chance that it could you know colloquially go to the moon that kind of argument obviously uh now i disagree with that as well but i'm just curious how how would you uh respond to that kind of view how would you caution you know, newcomers to crypto against kind of getting lost amongst all of the altcoin gambling. Yeah, so I, I think that the reason that we we do hear that view is because there's some truth to it, which is that if you go on coinmarketcap.com and you look at the different altcoins, first of all, I mean, obviously there's some that have just pumped and uh, you know have massive gains, but there's also some that have sustainably uh, increased their value even in, in Bitcoin terms. So for example, if you look at Ethereum, if you'd bought Ethereum at the presale uh, and then held it to today, uh, you would have, you could convert it into more Bitcoins today uh, than you would have if you'd bought Bitcoins uh, at the presale. So clearly there, there's some truth to it. Now, obviously that's 100% hindsight bias and survivorship bias uh, because who knows how many other presales you would have invested in uh, and lost your shirt on. But 
uh, even that aside, I think that um, the they are right that Bitcoin has uh, less upside than it did in the past, uh, and that's just mathematically true. Now, I, I would argue that um, how much upside does one need in life? Uh, and Bitcoin still has a tremendous amount of upside going for it. Um, and it's also massively de-risked. Uh, and so if you look at it from kind of a risk-adjusted expected return, uh, Bitcoin still has a higher risk-adjusted expected return than uh, altcoins um, or any given one altcoin. Um, and then the other side, it, it, the other thing is that if you look at what at equilibrium, you know, and part of the difficulty here is whether you're communicating with someone who is a, a day trader or uh, someone who is a long-term investor, because I, I think a, a day trader doesn't really care about what is the terminal value of Bitcoin at equilibrium, you know, when it's reached full adoption, you know, what's the total addressable market of Bitcoin? Like they don't care. They're, they're looking at uh, whether it's going to pump tomorrow or yesterday. Uh, so, but for the long-term investor, you have to think about uh, what, what is the total addressable market for this, uh, this investment? And so for Bitcoin, it's, it's, global it's it's uh the global money and that's a total addressable market of you know however many billions of people there are today uh and then looking at all their portfolios and how much uh is held in cash and how much more would be held if uh bitcoin was cash or bitcoin was the global money um and so um that's a massive 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 addressable market now if you have an altcoin uh that's dentacoin that is for dentists uh, that's a much smaller total addressable market. And here we're assuming that Dentacoin is wildly successful, right? And that every dentist uses Dentacoin. Uh, even that, just it wouldn't touch Bitcoin's uh, full potential. Uh, so I think that yeah, on, uh, in that regard, I mean, Dentacoin is kind of a silly example, but there's other ones, you know, like uh, that, that market themselves as memes, essentially. So for example, with Ethereum, you have to look at what's the total addressable market for smart contracts and for a token issuance. Now, you could argue that, oh, you know, that's everything's going to be tokenized and everything's going to be uh, on the blockchain. And then, all right, well, how much value does Ethereum itself, F, the, 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 uh, the money, ETH, the ticker symbol, how much does it accrue from that use case? Uh, and you could argue that if someone is using Ethereum just to issue their token and have an ERC-20 token on the Ethereum blockchain, well, uh, the the holding period for that would be very short, right? It's just the time that the, the, the investor in the ERC-20 token buys Ethereum, sends it to this ICO promoter, and then the ICO promoter dumps it to, you know, buy a yacht or go on the beach or ideally pay for investors to develop the project. Um, and so that doesn't really seem like a very good uh, long-term investment uh, compared to Bitcoin, uh, just because of the way it's marketing itself, but also the way that it is designed from an engineering perspective uh, in terms of its scalability and uh, its, its, uh, its decentralization. Fantastic points, Pierre. Really agree with that. Excellent answer. Um, okay, I think we're pretty much getting to the end of our time. I've got to let you go, Pierre. Um, but uh, look, guys, you can find Pierre on Twitter. His handle is at Pierre underscore Rochard. And he also runs BitcoinAdvisory.com. And also look up his podcast, Noted Podcast. Pierre, have you got any other projects or anywhere else that you would like the listeners to uh, find where they, you would like them to find you online? Uh, now you listed them all. Um, I think that on, on all of the topics that uh, we were talking about, we could probably uh, dig into it for another few hours. So uh, I hope to be back on. Uh, and yeah, this was fun. Thanks for having me on. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Pierre. Bye. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Pierre Rochard. As usual, I will set up a show notes page on my website, stefanlevera.com. Search SLP3 for the links associated with this episode. Lastly, 
as this is a new podcast, I'd really appreciate if you guys can give this podcast a five-star rating on iTunes if you enjoyed it. Uh, Please share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel, and if you have any feedback, please come find me on Twitter. My handle is at Stefan Levera. Thanks, guys. See ya.